everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today I'm joined by Chuck with Sheridan Park Farms. And today we are going to talk about raising pastured pigs, both for use on the homestead and hopefully to make a profit. So Chuck, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited to talk about pastured pork. I think the more that um, folks can raise food in their backyard, the better. And if they can make a profit from it, even even better yet. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about your farm operation and how you got started? with? Sure. Pork? Yeah. So we're in uh, we're just south of Greensboro, North Carolina, which is the third largest city uh, in North Carolina. Um, we're currently farming 32 acres, uh, 20 acres of that we own, uh, and then we lease an adjoining 12, uh, which is just it, conveniently, it's right next to us. It's, it's actually our neighbor's property. So that worked out really well, um, because there's, you know, no right of way issues or anything like that. It's just, it's right next to us. So we've got 32 acres. Sure. Um, my wife and I started farming. <clears throat> this will be, um, 18, 19, 20, this will be our fourth full year. Uh, we started in February. We got our first animals on the farm in February of 2018. Um, we started this venture with zero farming experience. Um, I've got about 28 years in the healthcare industry. Uh, my wife has 20 some years in the healthcare industry, and she um, works for an accountant's office by trade now. What she is what she does. And so we got in, we, you know, we, the good Lord looks out for drunkards and fools. I tell everybody. And so he's, he's kept his eye on us. Um, what got us into this, um, my wife had done a little bit of a summer internship at a local small butcher shop uh, in the foothills of North Carolina, and she came home one day and she said to me, she said, you know, I think there's something to this local food, like locally raised, ethically raised food movement. And up until then, I really didn't know much about it. I was, I was pretty, you know, pretty blind to the whole idea. So started doing a little bit of research and dang on, she was, she was right. She was on to something. So <laughs> we watched Food Inc. We started reading and listening to a lot of Joel Salatin and stuff and learning about regenerative ag and that kind of thing. And so we got really interested in, um, in, in farming and raising our own food. About that time, um, I had a job opportunity that was going to require a move for us. And so we decided during the move, we were going to uh, buy some buy some land and start raising some chickens uh, on our own and for you know basically for meat for us maybe have a few extra to sell I mean it wasn't you know it wasn't really we didn't go into it planning to to be a business essentially if we if we sold a few to cover our cost hey that was great we got some good food out of the out of the whole deal and so we found this property here in Greensboro and uh, and bought it and like I said, our, our initial goal was we were going to go all in on um, pastured poultry. We were going to do the the moving the chickens every day and, you know, the whole pastured poultry movement. And I was commuting back and forth uh, to work, and I was, I was consuming every bit of content that I could consume to learn about this farming thing that we were getting ready to start. And so... I was on my way to, to work one day and I was listening to a podcast and the name of it is uh, The Grass Fed Life, Darby Simpson and uh, Diego Footer. And they were talking about um, farming enterprises. And Darby made the, com the comment that pound for pound, hour for hour, that pigs were a much better investment than pastured poultry. So I came home and made the grand announcement, hey, we're getting pigs. <laughs> so... <laughs> My wife looked at me like I had two heads, um, but she, being the patient, um, the patient woman she is, she agreed to uh, she agreed to pigs. So I started searching on Craigslist. Had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I was I was completely in the dark on the whole deal. And so searching Craigslist, found a guy about an hour away that had some pigs for sale, and so we kind of worked the deal over Craigslist. So one rainy, nasty Saturday, we go up to this guy's uh, farm to buy these pigs and we pull up and it's a, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a beaten up farm. And it's kind of run down. But there's this huge barn there. We pull up, a couple of guys start walking out and then there's, th you know, four or five guys. And before you know it, there's about 15 people there. And I'm like, oh, what have we gotten ourselves into? And I said, yeah, I'm here to buy some pigs. And uh, one of the guys said, oh, you're looking for daddy. Let me go get him. So they go down to the barn. This little old man comes shuffling out. 
So he takes us up to where these pigs are, and he's got, I don't know, eight or ten pigs on just this little landscaping trailer with some sides on it. And uh, they can tell that I am a greenhorn from, from I have zero experience. <laughs> and the old guy looks at me and he says, boy, I'm going to pick this pig up off his trailer. And when his feet get off the ground, he's yours. If you drop him and he gets gone, I'll catch him. I don't know how long it'll be, but I'll catch him and I'll get him back to you. So he starts handing these pigs over to me. And I've never, I've never touched a pig. I mean, these are, they're eight weeks old. You know, they're pretty small. And you pick a pig up by the by its hind legs, and it's like a washing machine out of bounds. That thing just shakes, you know. I mean, they're just squealing and crap. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable at the noise they make. So we finally get these pigs loaded over into the into my truck, and so we we come home with them, and you know, I've I, out in the pasture, I've I've done all the stuff. I've bought the netting. I've bought the uh, the energizer. I've got the feed and the water. I mean, it's it's just it's a pastoral setting that to look at. It's beautiful. So we pull the truck down there, and I jump up on the back of the truck and I hand one of those pigs off the truck to my wife, and she puts it down on the ground. So this thing starts sniffing around and looking around, and it gets up next to the fence. And I had read and heard. I don't know. I don't don't know what I was thinking, but I had read and heard that when a pig touches that electric to their nose, if they're not trained, they're going to go through that 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 fence. That's absolutely correct. That's what they will do. <laughs> and so this pig is out here running around outside of this netting, and you've never seen a sight till you've seen two middle-aged, slightly overweight human <laughs> beings chasing a crazed pig across a soybean field. Oh my goodness. Oh my so God. somehow we managed to get that pig back into the netting and, and in the interim my wife has the wherewithal to turn the, the power off. So this pig gets caught back up in the netting. <clears throat> so she does this WWE suplex move on this thing and pins this pig to the ground. It's squealing, my dog's barking. So we get this pig up and put it back on the truck and we do what any two normal, rational, sane adults would do. We go to the house and have a beer. <laughs> Um, so Saturday <laughs> night, so Saturday night, these pigs end up sleeping like in true redneck fashion on the bed of my pickup. So about four o'clock Sunday morning, um, we're both awake. She's madder than snot. What are you going to do about these pigs? And so I email a guy that I had been watching on, uh, on YouTube and explain my conundrum to him. And he said, you've got to set up a training pen. You've got to have a hard structure that the pigs can't get through and put your electric in that. So when they hit it and they get shocked, they go forward. They can't go anywhere. They got to go back. He said, after about two days, they'll learn that the electric, they want to stay away from it. They can't go through it. So we wait till about nine o'clock. We hook the trailer up to the truck and me and my wife and the pigs go to tractor supply um, and get some pig panels uh, and some green tea posts. We come back. We set that up, um, so now we've got a structure that the pigs can't get out of. We put our netting inside, um, and then we hand these pigs off into this netting, and she and I drag up a, a lawn chair and um, enjoy watching the pigs squeal <laughs> as they hit that electric. So that was my first experience with pigs, and I think the take-home message there is, if you're interested in pigs, um, find a mentor that can help walk you through some of the sure. very, very basic steps of getting started with pigs. Um, pigs are much different than chickens um, or rabbits or any other bees or any other type of, of livestock that you can manage. Um, so get a mentor and, and learn the ins and outs of pigs. But Again, pigs are wonderful animals. Um, getting those pigs has been the best decision we could make for our farm from the business aspect and also from a land management aspect. Pigs are wonderful. So obviously you um, kind of had trial by fire. Yes. And, and <laughs> went through all the beginner mistakes, it sounds like. <laughs> Absolutely. So our our. Apologies. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, we, we did learn a lot of hard lessons. Um, and even now, you know, folks will, will call me up or email me and say, hey, can you tell me how to raise pigs? No, but I can tell you how not to. We've made all the mistakes, and I'll be glad to share those <laughs> with you and steer you, steer you clear of those. 
well, that's that's an important part of getting started, I guess, and is making those mistakes and knowing not not what to do again. Um, but would you say that pigs are are for everybody, or are there um, certain people that maybe shouldn't have pigs? Yeah. So um, no, pigs are not for everybody. Um, there's a couple of things that you're gonna that you're absolutely gonna need um, if you want to do pigs, um, particularly on scale. Um, pigs do require a bit of space. Um, you can keep a pig in a confined area, uh, you know, a, a pen, a 10 by 10, a 20 by 20 pen, uh, penned area. You can do that. Um, but if you're going to do that, you've got to have some pretty significant infrastructure in terms of fencing um, and confinement. Because those pigs, once they get, you know, 100 pounds, 125 pounds or so, pigs become very, very strong in their head and neck. And it's really, really easy for them to get out of a, out of a confined area. So if you're going to do them in a small space, uh, you've got to have some pretty significant infrastructure in terms of fencing and confinement. Um, if you decide you want to do a pastured pig, which we think is a, is a better way to, to raise those animals, we think it allows them to express their more natural tendencies. There's a lot of valuable land management things that you can do with pigs. Um, you're going to need some infrastructure there in terms of electricity, electric fence, some energizers, feeders, waters. And there's, there is a space requirement. Again, we're on about 32 acres. Um, I've got 37 pigs all together right now. We're working to ramp that up. But we're very quickly learning that we're going to run out of space. So having a good, having a good chunk of land um, is also something that you're going to want to think about. Um, pigs are very strong animals. Uh, so you need to be somewhat nimble and quick and be able to get out of, that, get out of their way. So uh, there may be some folks, you know, if, if you have maybe some physical challenges and some of that kind of thing, um, pigs may be uh, something you want to think about or at least make sure that you've got uh, plenty of help with. But, you know, p pigs are, once you kind of get them trained on that electric and you learn some of their tendencies, pigs are pretty easy to manage. Um, our daily routine now on our pigs, we've got some uh, some automatic watering systems in place. We've got some automatic feeding systems in place on some of our pigs. They're just a daily check, make sure the fence is clear, make sure that they've got plenty of feed and water. So pigs are, they're not for everybody, but they could be for most people. So do you, um, do you pretty much just raise them for meat or do you also breed them? What's, what's the best way to, um, I guess, to do that? We started out uh, just raising pigs for uh, for meat. Uh, that was the initial uh, plan. And so we were buying uh, feeder piglets, piglets that are eight weeks old that we're going to raise out. We're going to feed them up to, uh, you know, a certain weight. Our, our target weight is about 325 to 350 pounds uh, before we go to processing. So our initial deal was that was what we were going to do. And then we learned that we were losing our source of piglets. We had found a, a really good source for a very high quality pig that done well, that done really good on pasture, um, foraged well, grew quickly, um, easy to manage. So we started doing some artificial insemination so that we could continue our line of pigs and have and have plenty of pigs uh, later on. Then late last year, I attended uh, the Pharaoh to Finish School, which is a school that's put on by Jordan Green and his wife, Laura. Uh, they have a farm, Janelle Green Farms, up in uh, Edinburgh, Virginia. And in talking to some of the folks there and talking to, to Jordan and the guys that were in the school and just basically some general observation, we kind of figured out that good quality piglets were becoming more and more difficult to find. Um, so now we've entered into... Um, a bit more of a breeding operation. Uh, we now have four boars on property. We have, we've continued to do some artificial insemination because our male pigs just aren't big enough to fulfill their duties yet. Uh, so we're continuing to do some artificial insemination, but we're going to try to work and help fill that need for those good quality piglets that folks are looking for. More and more folks are getting interested in raising their own meat, knowing where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, providing some good quality food for, uh, you know, their local communities and a good quality piglet that has proven genetics that does well on pasture. Um, those things are getting a little tougher and tougher to find. So we're going to try to fill that need. And that's something that we're working on right now. And, and remind me, um, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but what breed of, of pigs do you have? 
So our two initial sows that we've started our herd off of were, they were just kind of a mutt pig. <clears throat> Had a little bit of Duroc, a little bit of Berkshire, a little bit of Yorkshire, a little bit of Tamworth. And we've started um, breeding those pigs back with some purebred Duroc and some purebred Berkshire. So that seems to be the combination that we're working on right now is having Berkshire and Duroc uh, primary as the, as the foundation of our herd. Um, we, have, we are adding a little bit of Hampshire, a little bit of, of uh, uh, Herdford pigs. Um, so we're experimenting just a little bit, but we found that a good mix, um, mixed breed pigs seem to do well. Uh, some of the more purebred pigs um, can have some health problems. We've just found that whenever you start crossing those, you get some hybrid vigor. Those pigs grow well. They do well. They grow fast. Um, and that just seems to work for us. So we're, we're experimenting a little bit with our breeds, but primarily Duroc and Berkshire. So for folks that might have um, options or maybe there's not uh, a mixed breed available, what are some of the better uh, beginner breeds? So I would go with, um, with a, again, with a Duroc. Um, those pigs uh, put on weight well. Um, they grow fast. Um, they're easy to keep. You know, another question that I get frequently is, what's the best breed of pig to keep? Um, what's the best temperament pig? Well, all pigs are easy to deal with, and all pigs can be difficult to deal with, depending upon how you manage them. Uh, one of the things that we found and noticed is that if you're over in those pens with those pigs and you're giving them belly scratches and scratching them behind the ears and giving them treats and that kind of thing, those pigs are very receptive to you. They come, I mean, in lots of ways, they act like a, much like a pet. Uh, on the opposite side, if you just fill that bulk feeder and, and fill that automatic water and just walk away and never interact with those pigs, um, they can be a little bit difficult and a little bit cantankerous to deal with. So I think the, 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 uh, it's not so much the breed of pig as it is the management and how you how you interact with those animals. Sure. I think that's to be said by with you know most most animals. I don't know that you know you can you necessarily tame an alligator or something, but you know chickens are the same way. If you just throw them out there, they're not going to be super friendly. But if you pet them or interact with them, they're going to be um, much nicer. And with pigs, I will make I will make this disclaimer. Pigs are large, strong animals, and you always need to keep your head on a swivel, know where they're at, be cautious. Um, but again, the more you, the more you uh, get over and, and, and manage them and work with them and spend time with them, the easier they are to handle. So I've, I've heard some um, stories, maybe is the right term for it, that um, pigs can be dangerous. Is that, is that? Um, more so just because of their size and maybe people not not interacting with them as often as yeah, they those, should? Yeah, those certainly are contributing factors. Um, whenever uh, the females are in heat, we've noticed that they tend to be more aggressive um, than whenever they're not in heat. So there's typically a couple of day period there every three weeks that, that our females can be a little bit aggressive. Um, and then on the, on the boar side, um, whenever those females are in heat, those boars have one thing on their mind, and you've got to be careful around be careful around the males um, during during the mating time. So those are typically mm -hmm. the times that you uh, that you need to kind of keep your head on a swivel and know where everybody's at and, and be cautious. It's during during the mating and the heat and the heat cycles. So do you keep them separated or are they all intermediate? We do. Yeah, we keep, uh, so right now we're keeping our boars separate from our, from our, uh, breeding gilts, um, primarily because our boars are brand new on the farm. Uh, those guys are still, I've got a couple mm -hmm. that are about 10 weeks old and a couple that are three and a half, four months old. So they're not to breeding age yet. Um, but we will keep them separate. Um, we will put the boars in with the females whenever everybody gets to size and gets to the appropriate age. And we'll leave them in there until um, until they're about ready to farrow. So pigs will carry um, their gestational period is three months, three weeks, and three days, and ends up being about fifteen, about one hundred and fifteen days. So we'll put the boars in with the with the females. They'll stay in with them for about four months, and then we'll pull them out, and they'll go to another group of females. Okay. So I imagine most people are. Um you know, going to be raising them for meat more so than, um, than production mm -hmm. of, of offspring of, for whatever uh, purpose there. Um, 
So what's kind of the basics to get started with that? What are, um, you know, you mentioned fencing is pretty important, but what are some other things before you even bring the pigs home that you would need to have? Yeah. So just a couple of, and, and you know, managing pigs is, is, doesn't require a whole lot of infrastructure if you're doing it out on pasture. Um, you're going to need a training pen. So we use just some pretty standard 16 foot long pig panels. You can pick those up at any local feed store, animal supply store, uh, tractor supply type, uh, rural king type stores. So we use those to set up a training pen. We use a couple of rolls of some fairly inexpensive um, electric poly wire. Uh, we use a Gallagher brand or a Speed Right brand. Usually we can pick those rolls up for anywhere between you know, 40 and $80 a piece, depending on what we're doing with them. You'll need an energizer. Um, We've used a couple of different types of energizers. We've used the kind that operates off of a 12 volt battery. And then we've also got uh, some solar energizers. We're starting to experiment with those a little bit right now to see how they do. Um, Some type of container for feed, uh, some type of container for water. Um, We found that just a black pickle barrel, um, usually you can pick those up on Craigslist or Marketplace for 15, 25 bucks with just some pig nipples. And again, those you can pick those up at, um, at Tractor Supply or your local feed store. Uh, that's really all you need. Uh, and then the pigs. So the, the beginning mm-hmm. stuff is, is really pretty simple. Um, one thing that I would say is that if you're uh, going to get into pigs and raise pigs for meat, um, always get at least two. Pigs are herd animals. You're going to find they do much better. They're easier to manage. They're much happier if, uh, if they have a buddy or they have a partner. So, uh, don't ever try. I wouldn't recommend trying to raise just one pig at a time. Get at least two. So if you're wanting to raise them for meat, does it matter um, male or female or, and I guess what age is a good, a good place to start? Is it something that you're better off with a younger pig? Sure. Great question. So um, on, on the sex of the animal, females are going to be fine. You're not going to have any issue there. Uh, if you do elect to raise a male, um, you really need to castrate uh, castrate those boys and and uh, turn them into what's called a barrow. That's a castrated male pig. There is some mm-hmm. um, some controversy slash discussion around what's called boar taint, um, and that comes from an increase in the testosterone hormone uh, that can be. Um, some folks can taste it in the meat. Some folks can't. Um, where we're raising animals on a production scale and we're selling that meat to the public by the cut for us, it just does not make sense to risk whether someone can or can't taste that boar taint. So we just go ahead and castrate. If you're going to, uh, if you're going to do males, go ahead and castrate them. Uh, that's best done whenever they're young. I would recommend start with a young animal. Um, typically piglets will get weaned off of the sow at about, uh, eight weeks of age. That's a great place to start. Get those pigs as soon as they're weaned off of their moms uh, and go ahead and and put them in your training pen and get them started early. They're going to learn that electric in about, uh, they typically will learn it in a couple of days. We'll usually leave pigs in a training pen for a week or so just to make sure everybody's comfortable and they they know the fencing really well before we turn them out on pasture. Sure. And then what kind of housing do they need? Um, I guess just some sort of a basic structure or, or anything particular? So in the wintertime, we provide, and, and keep, in, keep in mind, we're in central North Carolina. We don't have a lot of really, really bad, cold, frigid, deep freeze kinds of winters like folks in the northern, uh, the northern part of the United States can get. We can get some nights where it'll get down into the teens, occasionally single digits, but during the day it warms back up. So we provide some three-sided structures for those pigs that are portable. Um, we, call, we call them the ham house. I can pick those up with the forks on the tractor and move those around. Um, and the reason we provide those is just to keep those pigs in out of, the, out of the wind. In the spring, summer, and fall, we don't provide a structure for those animals. We provide them with some, you know, oh, yeah. with some junk hay. They will typically kind of make a nest. We do provide them, especially in the summertime, you've got to make sure you provide those animals with plenty of shade. Uh, and some areas where they can build some wallows. Pigs don't have the ability to sweat to cool mm-hmm. themselves. So that's why pigs mm-hmm. like to roll around in mud. It's cool. It provides a coating on their skin mm-hmm. to keep insects, flies, mosquitoes, and that kind of thing off of them. So they need, a, they need an area that's got an area that has uh, some water for a wallow, plenty of shade, um, and then in the wintertime, something to, get, something to keep them out of the wind. 
uh, again, we provide that little three-sided structure. It works great for them. Some of our adult pigs, we make sure they're in the in the in a wooded area, and we give them plenty of hay, and we may not even provide them with a structure. So, pigs are very self-sufficient. Uh, mm. They don't need a lot of a lot of housing. Um, no need for a whole lot of infrastructure related to the housing piece. Just make sure they've got uh, some cover from some trees, a little bit of hay to nest up in, and they're going to be fine. So it sounds like the startup costs, as far as you know, compared to at least some other animals, is pretty um, pretty reasonable. Yeah. So you really could get started with pigs minus the pigs for you know three hundred bucks or less by the time you buy. A couple mm-hmm. of pig panels, a few T posts. The energizer is going to be the most expensive thing that you're that you're going to have to buy. Um, we typically would recommend someone get you know a two or a three joule energizer at at minimum because you do want to have a nice hot energized fence for those pigs, especially when they're young. You want them to learn that that fence is hot. They don't want any part of it. You want to keep them away from that fence. Mm-hmm. So the energizer is going to be the most expensive piece for you, and uh, you can typically pick those up for you know about two hundred, two hundred and fifty bucks. Um, not very, not very um, expensive at all. So yeah, the startup costs are, are not bad at all. Well, that definitely um, helps. You know, some animals are so expensive to get started on. Um, and and what about feed? You know, you, you mentioned that they're on pasture, but um, I guess is it just a uh, uh, a feed that you buy from the feed store or, or what feed uh, options or nutrients or anything like that um, do you give them? Yeah, so we uh, we buy our feed from a local milling company, uh, which is about 15 minutes down the road here. They do a custom grind for us. Uh, it's about a 16% protein feed. Um, if you've got some uh, local feed mills in your area, they're going to be able to provide you with a, with a good uh, balanced swine feed. Um the commercial feeds, um, the uh, Purina, uh, Southern States, um, Bartlett, all of those companies provide a good, uh, typically a good balanced nutrition uh, feed for those pigs. We do provide our, our pigs with uh, free choice ration. Um, we could get our pigs to you know the 325, 350 mark um, without providing them with a whole lot of extra feed, but it would just take a lot longer. So we make sure that they've got plenty of feed available for them. But again, if you've got a local meal uh, close to you, those guys are going to have what you need. If you can't find that, typically your feed stores are going to have a good balanced uh, swine ration that you can pick up uh, for you know pretty reasonable price. Okay. And so I guess um, expanding on feeding, I guess, what, uh, what's the average age of butcher how long do we need to take care of these animals before we can so typically you're going to take about seven to eight months that's from from birth to processing seven to eight months to get a pig uh to to a good butcher size what we found with our animals uh, and in talking to a lot of other farmers it seems this seems to be um sort of the sweet spot is that 325 to 350 pound range uh, on the pig whenever you go to processing anything smaller than that the pigs seem to be pretty lean and don't have quite as much fat and marbling as what you would hope to see uh, through some of the carcass. Anything much larger than that, and the fat tends to start retarding some of the muscle growth, and you don't get a good loin, you don't get good loin chops and that kind of thing. So for us, again, we found that 325 to 350 pound range to be kind of the sweet spot. Okay. And so if we're raising pigs for butcher, um you know, I, in my mind, which I'm sure I'm wrong here, feeding a, a pig for seven months to get to 350 pounds sounds um, expensive, but obviously, you know, if you're able to profit from it, I'm, I'm mistaken there. So what, um, I guess, what is the profitability of pigs? Is it, how many pigs would you need to, um, so to be profitable? So that really is going to depend on the market that you're in. Um, again, we're in Greensboro, North Carolina. We're we live right outside the third largest city in the state. We're within an hour and a half of about 4 million people. Um, so we have a large market and within that market, there is the full gamut of, uh, socioeconomic, um, bents for folks. Um, and we tend mm-hmm. to, we, we target mm-hmm. folks that are, um, food conscious, 
they are interested in where their food comes from. They're interested in knowing their farmer. They're interested in clean food that's raised on pasture. And folks understand that that does take a little bit more money to, to, to purchase that high quality of, of product that we produce. So if you're interested in, in doing pigs as a production model or as, a, uh, as an enterprise, I would recommend starting with three. Um, that's going to give you one to put in your freezer and two to sell. And for those two that you sell, you'll be able to pay for, for your pig that you've put in your freezer. We're to the point now we realize we can realize about a $700 to, to $1,000 profit per pig. Um, once we raise them up, that count, wow. that includes feed costs, butcher costs, the whole, the whole deal. Um, we can realize somewhere between $700 and $1,000 per pig. We didn't get, we didn't start out wow, there. Um, you know, over time we've built sure, sure. a clientele, we've built a reputation, we've built, um, folks understand that they're buying a, a high quality product from us. And so we can command a little bit higher price than, than folks, other folks may be able to, again, because, you know, we target the folks that are interested in quality meat, locally raised, know your farmer, um, and just a high, a high end, higher end product. So what are some of your main outlets? I saw on your website the um, the farmer's market. Do you also ship or is it all pretty much just local local business? So far, everything's been local. We do two farmer's markets per week. Um, and then we also um, sell to a small local um, niche grocery, uh, grocery store uh, just down the road a little mm-hmm. ways. Um, and that's another outlet. We do a lot of on-farm sales. We have a lot of folks that come direct to the farm to buy. We're trying to crack trying to crack that shipping nut. Um, we did do a shipping um, experiment a couple of weeks ago. Didn't work out very well, but we learned some valuable lessons. So we're working on trying to get the shipping piece uh, down and get that uh, get that to where that's something that we can offer to customers, and we can you know get our product out to a little wider audience. Um, the shipping of meat is just that's just a you know the packaging, the dry ice, the the time in which you have to ship it, the cost for shipping. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a little bit of a cost prohibitive thing, but we're trying to figure that out. Sure. Well, and especially right now, there's a lot of uh, shipping challenges for everybody. <laughs> with shipping delays and, and things. And, you know, frankly, Amazon is spoiling us all. I mean, you know, it's, it's super easy mm-hmm. to, you know, order, uh, you know, a, a computer mouse on your phone tonight and it's at your door, you know, tomorrow by lunch. Um, so Amazon's yeah. kind of ruined us all. And, and those of us that don't have that, <clears throat> those big outlets and those big connections with UPS and the postal service, we're, we're still floundering and trying to get that deal figured out. Yeah, I definitely experienced that with our, uh, our little shop as well. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, um, kind of going back to the husbandry side of things, um, can you you mentioned that there was a lot of benefits of raising them on pasture and the land management aspects, and I just was hoping that you could touch on that. Sure. So that first set of pigs that I was talking about, when when we bought the farm that we're on, there really hadn't been a whole lot done to it other than um, there were some crops, that, just some some row crops that were being raised, corn, soybean, tobacco, winter wheat, and so. The pa- what are pastures now were previously fields where these, these crops are being raised, and that soil was hard-packed soil, didn't absorb any water. There was a lot of runoff. I mean, it was just no nutrients whatsoever. I mean, it was just it was in pretty rough shape. So that first year, we ran those pigs across one of those fields, let them till that up and stir up that latent seed bank, put down some manure. We were throwing some junk hay out there, so they were kind of stomping that carbon in. And so now those fields that were originally just a hard pan, hard packed dirt, we've got some some really nice grasses growing on it. So pigs are great at stirring that latent seed bank up, aerating the soil, fluffing it up, and just adding some life to it. Um, we've also found in running our pigs through some of our wooded areas, they do a fantastic job of clearing some of that understory, some of that underbrush, and knocking that stuff down. We'll follow them with a chainsaw and start cutting down some of the junk trees, some of the smaller trees, opening up some of that canopy. And so we've started in some of the areas on our farm now, we've started to build some beautiful silvo pasture 
that are perfect to run our sheep through, for example. And so this all becomes a, a very symbiotic relationship and everything just kind of feeds on itself. We bring the pigs through and let them stir the ground up and fluff that up. We come along and sow maybe a little bit of cover crop behind it, a little, uh, you know, some rice, some wheat, some oats, and that kind of thing. Let that start springing up. We bring the sheep back across that, so we're now generating some forages for our sheep. We run the sheep across that. Then we'll bring our pasture chickens behind that and let the pasture chickens, um, you know, take advantage of some of the sheep manure and, you know, dig around for grasses and bugs and worms and all that kind of stuff. And then it's time to bring the pigs back through. So we just create this continuous cycle of animals moving across our farm and we can increase the production capacity of the land while we're getting, you know, we're building soil. You know, everything's putting manure down. We're stomping the carbon back in sure. and we're just building some life back into this farm that when we bought it was, I mean, it was just becoming barren and, and you know, unless you were just pouring the chemicals to it, nothing would grow here. And so it's that symbiotic relationship, and the pigs play a huge role in that. They're our tillage tool. They're our aerators. They're our uh, land clearing tool. They're, I've got a group of pigs right now and some bamboo that's 30 feet tall, and these girls are just tearing this stuff down and pushing it over, and they're just, you know, it's a great, uh, they're eating it, and they're just opening, the, opening that stuff up. So I get excited talking about pigs and what they can do what they can do with land because my grandmother told me she said oh you'll never grow you'll never grow any grass and then pigs around and now she comes down and she can't believe what we're doing on this farm with getting this getting this grass to grow and we've had pigs on it it's just unbelievable sure that's amazing so do you need to rotationally um to, to rotate their fields and things for um, for disease and, and worms like you do other animals? Yes, absolutely. So we keep those pigs moving. I like, we typically will leave pigs on a spot. And that's another question we get. How long can pigs stay in an area? Well, it depends on how big the area it is. depends on how many pigs you've got there. depends on how big the pigs are. 10 100-pound pigs are going to do a different amount of damage than 10 200-pound pigs. They're just... There's more pressure on that, sure. so we do keep everything moving. Um, we want to get them off of their off of their manure. Of course, pigs do tend to have a bathroom area within their uh, within their paddocks, so we do want to move them off that. We also want to distribute that manure around. We don't want pigs just in one place where there's just this this uh, overabundance of manure and it's not being spread out. And then also, if you leave pigs on an area too long, they're going to compact the ground. Uh, particularly around feed and water stations, and it's going to be more difficult to get grass growing in those areas. Um, and I've done that a couple of times. I've left pigs in a spot too long, and they've really compacted down around where the feed and water was. We were moving some sheep today, and we were moving their, their hay feeder, um, and a guy that was helping me, uh, David, he said, something's been here before. And I said, yeah, I had to pick, I had the pig feeder there one time because it was just compacted and there wasn't any grass growing. So, yeah, you got to keep those animals moving. Piggies, pigs need to keep moving from space to space uh, on a pretty regular rotation. Sure. That makes sense. So are there any other common um, beginner mistakes or, or even um, misconceptions about raising pigs that you've found along the way from... Um, from talking to other people and then, you know, other mistakes that you've made. Yeah. As well. So one thing, I, one of the big misconceptions is that pigs stink. Um, and again, if you, if you're moving those pigs and you keep them rotated around, um, and you, and you distribute that manure out over a, over a broader area, we have very, I mean, very little odor at all. The only time we really get much odor is if we've had a, just a ton of rain, um, and that manure starts to liquefy some and you can get a little bit of an odor there but otherwise i mean the farm doesn't doesn't stink i mean you really don't smell those pigs um mistakes that we've made not moving them frequently enough um we again we have had some pigs that we've left in an area for a little bit too long and we've and we you know we're trying to we've had to go back and recover some of the damages that that's been caused there um Making sure that that fence stays on. Um, we have left the accidentally left the fence off, and they do get kind of curious, uh, and they will they will push across it. Um, and then also not making sure that the area around your fencing is clear. Pigs tend to berm. Um, they push leaves and sticks and material around, and they will push that right up to the edge of that fence because that's as far as they can go. Oh, really? 
and over time they'll push that up against that fence and that fence will ground out and you'll lose your you'll lose your energy on the fence so making sure fences stay clear but otherwise i mean just good just good general management practices always make sure they got plenty of feed they got plenty of water and the fence is good those are the three key the three key things to being successful with pigs wonderful well, obviously, um, you know, there's more than we could talk about just in our uh, short podcast here. But I know that you have some really great resources, um, your YouTube channel and your website. So can you share those with us so that if somebody's wanting to get more information, um, they can they can get that information from you? Yeah. So we've got a YouTube channel um, and our YouTube channel. It's, it's kind of interesting how that started. We started our YouTube channel. We wanted to just do some videos that we we're going to post over on our uh, over on our web page to give our customers a little bit of an insight into you know who we are and how their food's being raised and give them kind of a, a behind the scenes look well one video turned into two into three into 150 videos now so we've got a youtube channel uh, it's sheraton park farms if you just google or just search us on youtube you'll find us over there we talk about all things pigs chickens sheep just general farming stuff. We do land clearing, tractor work. I mean, we've got all kinds of stuff going on over there. Um, but our primary focus is on pigs and on pastured pigs. And then also our, um, we also have a webpage. It's SheratonParkFarms.com. Um, you can find us there. And then we're also on Facebook and also on Instagram. Uh, love to talk pigs with folks. So if you've got a question, uh, please reach out to us. We're glad to try to you know, provide what information we can and uh, help folks out. We think this is a great lifestyle. We think pigs are a great animal to have on your farm, uh, and we, we encourage folks to give them a try. Wonderful. And, of course, as always, we'll put the show notes, or I'm sorry, we'll put the links in the show notes that uh, folks can find you easier there. Um, and, Chuck, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you sharing your time and your education with us. Nicole, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And for those listening, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Backyard Bounty, and we'll see you again next week. Uh-huh.